Good morning. Good morning. There we are. Welcome to the service of worship um, here at Hampton United Church on this beautiful, kind of cloudy, but still warm Sunday morning. Welcome to those of you in the sanctuary. Welcome to those who are worshiping with us online. Just a couple of announcements before we begin. A reminder that today is the day that your new minister, Tori Mullins, is being ordained. And as was noted in the uh, announcements that were sent out by email, we have an opportunity to be part of that service through following the link that gets us into the visual, into being able to be part of the service online. That takes place at three o'clock this afternoon, and I really hope that all of us will be able to do that. This is an important occasion, obviously, in Tori's life, and it's also a way that all of us can show our support and our delight in this significant achievement. Reminder as well that there will be a brief meeting of the Unified Board uh, to discuss a couple of uh, brief matters immediately after the service. It shouldn't take long, but uh, those of you who are board members and who can stay, that would be great. Any other announcements? Barb. Good morning. Um, I think most of you are aware that ALS tragically affected one of our church families last fall. And the annual fundraiser for the ALS Society is an event called Walk Strong, and it's being held in St. John at Harbor Passage on June the 4th. And Jolene Bettle has registered a team called Friends and Family of John. And they're looking for support that we may be able to offer in uh, the form of walkers who want to join them on that day or with financial uh, contributions to their team, which goes to the ALS Society. And Jolene and Jane and John's newest grandson, Theodore John, who was born in January, are going to join us here for worship on the 29th of May. And they would gratefully um, receive any donations you wanted to make towards the team at that time, or just welcome your, your support. Um, good. And Wonderful. also those who are involved in the Ukrainian crisis relief committee that we've kind of informally formed. We're going to have a quick um, little talk after church this morning as well. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Lots, uh, lots going on, lots of, lots of important things going on. And both of the, <clears throat> both of the um, examples, both of the, both of the um, events and activities that, that you just mentioned, Barb, are entirely consistent with the theme of today's service, which is that of love and the importance of showing love in clear and tangible ways is, at least according to Jesus, absolutely foundational, absolutely central to religious life and to living in ways that are consistent with how we have been created. So we give thanks for these initiatives. We give thanks for the opportunities we have. And we give thanks for the light of Christ that continues to guide us and sustain us during all of our days. Another way that we live out our commitment to Jesus' way is to acknowledge every week that the land on which we live and work and worship in this part of the world is land that is by law the unceded territories of Indigenous peoples. 
We pray this morning that we would live with respect on this land, that we would leave in peace and friendship with his people and that we may be ambassadors to developing full and right relations with all of our sisters and brothers. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Jesus said, love one another. Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, now I call you my friends. Let us pray together. Loving God, you walk with us from the time of our birth and accompany us through every season of life. You fill our lives with the wonder of your love and your spirit moves throughout the world to reveal your purposes for every living thing. Help us to discern your presence anew and bear witness to the power of love in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our opening hymn is number 333, Love Divine. I'm going to do two, share two passages of scripture this morning. Um, one that isn't listed on the, uh, on the order of service. The first comes from the book of 1 Corinthians. This is one of the most well-known passages. It is Paul's testament to love. This is a text that is often read at weddings. But when Paul was writing it, he was directing it to the life of the church. So he wasn't thinking of love in romantic terms, as we sometimes do when we hear these words being read. Rather, he was thinking of it in terms of being an essential element of community life and of the life of faith. Paul says, if I could speak in any language in heaven or on earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I knew all the mysteries of the future and knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, 
what good would I be? And if I had the gifts of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, without love, I would be no good to anybody. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would be of no value whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable and it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. It's never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love will last forever. The second reading comes from John's Gospel, from the 13th chapter, Jesus' own reflections on love. Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me and just as I told the people, so I now tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. But this new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another as I have commanded you. May God add blessings and understandings to these readings from Scripture.
Let us pray. Only one, may the word spoken, heard, and pondered be acceptable in your sight and be in accordance with your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A while ago, I started having some problems with my lower back. Anybody had ever had problems with their lower back? Yeah. Well, it's not fun, as some of us know all too well. So I finally took some advice and visited the chiropractor. Doctor did some x-rays, told me I had a disc that was prone to slip. So he did some adjustments, gave me some exercises, and also gave me this piece of advice. If you are lifting anything heavy, do not make sure you bend at the knees and not at the waist. Make sure you bend at the knees and not at the waist because this way, the weight of what you're picking up will be carried by your thigh muscles rather than the weaker ones in your back. If you only remember one thing, remember this. Bend at the knees and not at the waist. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Well, it worked for a while. But then I was helping a friend move. And I spent the day transferring boxes and pieces of furniture into and out of a truck. I felt okay and the day ended, but the next morning I could barely move. I literally crawled out of bed, contorted myself into some kind of position that allowed me to get on my feet without screaming and went limping back to the chiropractor. He looked at me and shook his head and asked what had happened. Well, I was helping a friend move and I was moving some boxes of books out of a small closet with a narrow door and I had to bend to get them out. The doctor looked at me. He said, you didn't remember the one thing I told you. Did you? You need to remember. When you're lifting anything, bend at the knees and not at the waist. Well, truth be told, this lapse in judgment, this failure, I guess, to take certain instructions is not entirely untypical of my personality. And you too may have known times recently or in the past when you have ignored some wise advice yourself. We repeatedly hear that we should exercise regularly, eat a proper balanced diet, not stack on chips and candy bars and soft drinks and make sure we get enough sleep. But do we always do that? We're regularly told to visit our healthcare provider or go to the emergency room if there's a problem, to monitor our blood pressure, to take our medications. And we're often instructed to limit the amount of time we spend on the computer, to turn away from all of the bad TV news when we're feeling down and depressed, and make sure we get out and exercise and spend time in activities we enjoy. But do we always listen? Even though we know that this advice is sound, do we always? Do it? Well, if you do, I would really like to talk to you afterwards. 
and figure out how that's the case. Because I certainly don't. And if you're like me, part of the reason for that may be that at some basic level, most of us do not like to be told what to do. And there are lots of voices these days that suggest we really don't have to listen to anyone, especially to people in authority, about much of anything. There are the self-help gurus who counsel that following a set of external rules can represent a repressive and an unhealthy obstacle to self-fulfillment. There are the politicians who encourage us to worship the virtues of freedom and independence and self-realization above everything else. And there are those like those who participated in the trucker's convoy that occupied downtown Ottawa some months ago who counseled and who believed that obeying certain restrictions, obeying certain guidelines was inherently unfair and unjust and should be resisted. In many ways, many of us want to be able to choose, want to be able to make decisions for ourselves on our terms. Because at some basic level, we may think that we know best. Well, I understand some of that because there's pieces of that within my own psyche. And for that reason, the message found in both of today's readings, especially the ones from John's Gospel, can be challenging and even off-putting. For Jesus gives a clear and direct command that leaves no ambiguity or wiggle room. Love one another as I have loved you, John says. And Jesus said these words as a commandment. It's not just a suggestion, not just good advice, not wise insights about how to live rich and meaningful days. Rather, he uses the language of commandment rather than choice to reinforce his belief that this particular injunction is foundational, both to religious life and to human well-being, but isn't naturally or easily done. Indeed, he spoke these words immediately after Judas had left the Last Supper and was off to betray him. The religious and imperial authorities were conspiring against Jesus. Judas had thrown his lot in with them, and Jesus knew that trouble was on the horizon. So at a time like this, the impulse to love, especially to love those who wanted to do him and his disciples harm, would not have been natural. Yet for Jesus, the call to love was foundational. So he commanded his disciples to love one another because he was pretty sure they wouldn't if they were left to their own devices. But it's not just any commandment that deserves attention. Rather, it's the specific commandment to love that he gives. And this is a detail that we in the church have sometimes forgotten. Recently, the Barna Research Group conducted a survey of 16 to 29-year-old Americans. And the study found that the top three attributes 
that young Americans associated with present day Christianity were being anti-gay, being judgmental, and being hypocritical. 91% of young Americans saw Christians as being anti-gay. 87% saw them as being judgmental. 85% thought the church was filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And I'm pretty sure that Canadian statistics would likely be similar. And it's not just the under 30 crowd who believe that following some of our rules the rules that we have adopted, the rules that we have promoted that actually don't have much of anything to do with love are repressive and unhealthy. So we know that using the language of commandments in a general sense can indeed be fraught with danger. And to be sure, churches past and present have made some serious errors because we have fallen into that trap. But one enduring strength of the Christian tradition is our ability to acknowledge our foibles and shortcomings and recognize our ongoing need for guidance and help. And isn't that important? in a world filled with selfishness and fear and suspicion of those who are different. Don't we need help and guidance to resist those impulses? In a world filled with a cacophony of sound bites and Twitter postings that divide the world into us and them and assume that the thems are stupid and dangerous. Doesn't it make sense to focus on a set of values and practices taught by Jesus that have proven their value over two millennia and that have fostered all kinds of incredible good? Well, I think it does. And even though many may feel that organized religion no longer has anything of value to offer, I continue to believe that through Jesus, God offers the world what it desperately needs, namely the commandments to love. Yes, some non-religious people, some atheists sometimes do far more gracious and loving things than some of us do. And we Christians don't automatically become better people simply because we walk into a building like this. But we know that. We know that we need guidance and direction and regular reminders of God's unconditional love for us and for all people, and that we are called to be instruments of that love. Our spiritual and emotional health is dependent on all of that and embracing this understanding heeding the commandment to love can help us creatively respond to the needs that surround us today and don't we need that how many of us here's a question how many of us suffer from too much love in our lives Anybody walk in the church this morning? You know, I just there's just too there's just too much love going on. I just I just can't I just I just can't take it. How many of us think there's not enough compassion, or or that there's too much compassion in the world today? You turn on the news when you watch the stuff that's going on. You're saying, you know, things are going real well. We're just, humanity is just pulling together and we're doing all of these great things and we're caring for one another and looking after one another. Have you ever thought that after a newscast in I don't know how long? Anybody? How many of us in this church have ever heard someone at the door say, you know, I just don't think this is the congregation for me. 
because you folks just seem to be too loving and too caring. Any of us ever heard that? I've been in congregations across the country for 30 years. And I will tell you that I have never heard that. But I can also tell you that love can and does make a huge difference. The kinds of activities and initiatives that Barb was talking about just at the beginning of the service are some of the ways that that is expressed. And I've seen other examples of it too that make a huge difference. One evidence of that occurred when I served a little congregation a couple of hours north of Winnipeg, Manitoba. One of its members was a retired nurse by the name of Vidi, who lived independent. She was a spirited gal, but then she badly shattered her leg in a wicked winter fall. She was hospitalized for several weeks. And because she was much better at delivering medical treatment, than she was at receiving it. She was just counting the days till she could get out of that place and go home. But then she learned that because she lived by herself, she was gonna to have to go to a nursing home in a neighboring town an hour away to complete her convalescence. And this would probably go on for two or three months. Ovidi was absolutely devastated. She was independent. She hated being dependent. She loved her house. And she was inconsolable. But she had some friends. Friends in the church who heard her despair. And who decided that they would try to help. So over coffee one morning, they came up with a plan whereby every day, one of them would show up at Vidi's house the beginning of the day and would stay there until Vidi went to sleep. They, on the day that they were on, they would prepare her meals, they would clean her house, they would run her errands, they would look after some of her personal needs, and do whatever else was needed to see her through this time. And then they pooled the resources to hire someone to come in and stay there all night. This was no easy feat. It involved no little sacrifice on their part, in part because none of them were spring chickens anymore. And they also had their own family responsibilities and other things, other aspects of their lives to attend to. But they did it. And when I asked them why they did it, they said, well, because we know that we are to love one another. That's what it is about. And that's what we are trying to do. Well, that is love in action. And all of us have the opportunity to show love in a variety of ways, many of which are not as extreme as the example that I just gave, but are nonetheless significant. And another way you can do that is to offer a loving welcome to your new minister, Tori Mullins, and her family when she arrives. I can tell you that moving into a new community where you have no roots and beginning life in a new church can be challenging propositions. So making Tori and her family feel welcome in tangible ways 
can be far more important than you may, than you may realize. And we can all do that by tuning into her ordination service this afternoon and sharing this important occasion with her. We can send her notes of welcome and begin to make recommendations about special places she should go, special things she should do, even where you get the best ice cream around. And when they arrive, we can drop off goodies. We can help them get oriented. We can just let them know that we're really happy that they're here. And as someone who has moved into new communities in exactly the same way that Tori is, I can't emphasize enough how important such acts can be. And I know, I absolutely know that in your hearts you are a caring and a loving and a welcoming community of faith. And I encourage you to draw on those impulses and share that spirit that's within you. For amazing things do happen when Jesus' commandment to love one another as I have loved you is heard and heeded. And just as my back stays strong, when I remember and follow the advice of my doctor, bend at the knees and not at the waist, we can grow in faith and understanding when we remember and heed Christ's commandment to love. May it be so. Amen. The screen that I normally look at is not up here, so I think the next hymn is 138, My Love Colors Outside the Lines. Is that what we're doing, Janet? Five, Five sixty, oh master, let me walk with thee. I knew I should have updated this thing before I left this morning. Five sixty, oh master, let me walk.
we are given opportunities to share our gifts of time and talent and energy and financial resources with the world through the ministry of this church. We are grateful for the ways that we can share these gifts. And we are grateful this morning for all of the gifts that are given. As we receive these gifts this morning, let us pray together. Generous God, we bless you for your gifts of life, love, and faith. Bless the gifts we bring and make them signs of hope and renewal in the world we serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us once again join our hearts and minds in prayer. Holy One, in the midst of a world that is filled with lots of pain and uncertainty and anguish, and in which the impulse to love seems far removed. We give you thanks this day for the many wonders of our world, for spring sunshine and refreshing rain, for colors beginning to explode in blossoms opening and grass greening, and for all of the signs of new life that are abounding. We ask that the earth would be made fruitful in this growing season so that food will be plentiful for the hungry, and so that beauty will fill the souls of those in need of light and hope. We also give thanks this day for this community of faith, for the warmth and the welcome that is offered here, for the impulse to love that is expressed in many ways, for friendships and faithfulness discovered, and for the many acts of kindness that define who we are and that give tangible expression to Jesus' message. On this day, we also give thanks, O oh God, for our families and friends who offer us love and encouragement as we move through life. We pray for those families and communities whose lives have been disrupted by war and conflict, especially in Ukraine and in other places of turmoil. We remember those who worry about safety each day, what the future will hold for them. We remember as well those who are victims of forest fires in the States, those who are dealing with floodwaters up north and out west, and those who are finding these days to be challenging and hard. We ask that those with decision-making power would be guided to consider the lives of the vulnerable as being very precious when they establish their policies and make decisions that protect the future for them. We also remember those who are facing uncertain days, those who are dealing with illness, those who are waiting for treatment, those who are mourning the loss of someone dear, those who feel lonely or discouraged. We remember all who are homeless or unemployed, all who know hunger or despair, and all who face danger or discrimination every day. And we pray for those who are close to us, those who we love, whose names we lift before you now either spoken aloud or in silence.
Empower us with your spirit to reach out to those in need and share as we are able the love you offer. Make us expressions of your courage and peace as we join our voices with Jesus followers all around the world followers of the Jesus who taught us when we pray to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now let us join together in our closing hymn, which is Janet. More voices, 79, Spirit, open my heart, verses 2 and 3. Thank you. Reminder of the conversations that will take place immediately after the service of the folks around you offering Ukrainian support and members of the Unified Board. Thanks once again to our technical crew for their hard work, to Janet and the choir for their ministry of music, and a special thanks to one of the un- sung sometimes servants in this church, Barb in the Barb in the kitchen for coffee. Thank you, wherever you are, thank you. Now let us go forth in this place to live fully, to love boldly to be instruments of God's grace and goodness as we are able, and to share the love that Jesus expressed to the world through our every deed and word. 
And now may the grace of God attend you. May the love of God surround you. And may the Holy Spirit keep you. This day and always. Amen.